Okay, so, so I was asked to speak today about chronic pain management, an integrative approach, which is essentially talking about um, medications and non-medications that could be used for chronic pain. Um, can we go to the next slide? So this is Hippocrates, and Hippocrates was aware that in order to cure the human body, it is necessary to have a knowledge of the whole of things. So what you'll see soon is it's more than just physical. Can you move on? Um, so pain involves, um, total pain involves um, physical phenomena, which includes somatic, visceral, and neuropathic mechanisms, which we'll talk about, but then a whole element of suffering. And suffering are the psychological states and traits, um, things that involve social, family functioning, and spirituality, um, financial con concerns, loss of work, physical disabilities, coping skills before. And so we'll talk about some of these um, because the integrative modalities work on the suffering. Next slide. So um, the first thing we like to do is look at acute versus chronic pain. When people are in acute pain, and the best way to, um, to think of acute pain is immediately after something like surgery or an immediate injury, um, there is a fight or flight reaction from the body. And so the heart rate, the respiratory rate, even the blood pressure could be up, the patient is sweating. Um, with chronic pain, people may not look like they're in pain. Many times they're just sleep disturbances, a lot of fatigue, personality changes, um, anxiety, um, constipation, and what we call vegetative signs. People look kind of depressed. Um, and this is generally what chronic pain looks like, which unfortunately then many people um, who look at you may not believe that you have chronic pain. Next slide, please. So there are different mechanisms of pain, somatic, visceral, and neuropathic. Um, somatic pain, the best example to think of is something like bone pain, and people describe aching, gnawing, and localized pain. Um, for the most part, um, people with cherry and uh, cerebral myelia will have neuropathic pain, and this is disruption of a um, nerve somewhere in the peripheral or central nervous system. And what I'd like to explain is that this is kind of like seizure of a nerve in that there will be shooting pain, burning numbness, aching sensations. It's very severe um, and usually needs a combination modality treatment to treat the pain. Um, wanna move on? So for pain, um, step or level one, um, and these are old time levels. Common medications that are used include um, acetaminophen, which is um, Tylenol, some of the non-steroidals like ibuprofen, naproxen, um, trilocate, and even aspirin. Um, Ketorolac is an IV brand if you're in the hospital. Um, but it's the non-steroidals, aspirin, and acetaminophen in general that are used in this step one level of pain. Um, Want to move up to the next slide. Step two is moderate pain. And in general, at this point, people might be using opiates um, with or without some adjuvant analgesics. In general, these analgesics are, again, things like Tylenol, um, acetaminophen, and or um, some of the non-steroidals with a um, lower dose um, opiates such as hydrocodone and oxycodone. Another medication that would be put into this step is a medication called Tremadol or Ultram. Um, and this is like a um, medicine that is, um, works on opiate receptors, but also has an added um, medicine that works on serotonin, which is similar to like um, what the antidepressants do. Um, Want to move on? And then for severe pain, there are um, stronger opiates with 
long acting being used and short acting being used for the rescue dosing or acute pain. You wanna move on? Um, now some of the pain treatment myths, infants and children do not experience pain, their neurologic symptoms are not fully developed. Um, there have now been many studies that show that this is not true, that infants and children do experience pain. And in fact, when procedures are done on infants and children and you know, done early without giving them any pain medicine, the brain becomes rewired so that the, pers the person will have more pain later on when they have um, a pain experience. Want to move on? Um, another myth is most people who use opiates run a large risk of respiratory depression. This is also not true if you're under medical care and opiates are titrated slowly and used for physical pain. Um, it, it is unlikely to, uh, to occur. Now, if opiates are used for the emotional, social, spiritual pain, um, respiratory depression can occur. Want to move on? Um, what are some of the terms that are important to use if you're on opiates? Well, physical dependence is something that happens with opiates. I like to think of this as a Dunkin' Donuts phenomena and happens with a lot of medicine so that if like Dunkin' Donuts where you get caffeine, if you abruptly um, stop the caffeine or you abruptly stop an opiate without tapering down, you're gonna get withdrawal. Um, and so this happens with, as I said, with benzos, with um, opiates, with caffeine, with steroids. You have to titrate down slowly or you go into withdrawal and you feel terrible. Wanna move on? Now, Addiction is an overwhelming preoccupation with the medicine. It's getting the medicine for non-medicinal purposes um, or using it even for um, social, spiritual issues. It results in reduced quality of life and is associated with continued use despite harm. There was um, an article many, many, many years ago that said that fewer than 0.1% of few chronic pain medication users develop addiction. We now know that this was actually a letter in a journal and was never studied. Um, so as probably most of you are aware, addiction is something that is being looked at critically today with the use of opiates. And the number may be higher with people who chronically use opiates. Um, there is indication that those who become addicted are those who would ha um, have a predisposition in terms of other addictive um, personality, um, personalities or family history or abuse history. Um, but there is, as you're aware, a whole issue now of addiction and addiction being an issue even with um, medications prescribed by physicians. And so, as we all know, it's very difficult to get opiates for, from physicians. And for chronic pain, it's not considered the first thing that um, people will, um, physicians will give you and will be something that they're not going to want to have you on for long periods of time. They're going to want you to maybe be on opiates immediately post-operatively and then to find other ways to treat the pain. Um, pseudo addiction looks like addiction, but many times occurs because people um, are not getting enough medicine. And sometimes we see this. Um, you wanna move on? Another myth is that good options for treating pain do not exist. Well, that's actually not true. In fact, there are many options to treat pain. You wanna move on? So 
If you are on an opiate, just to be aware, constipation is always there when you're on an opiate, and so prophylactically you need to use laxatives and stool softeners. Um, nausea and vomiting can occur, sedation can occur, and as I said, respiratory, respiratory depression shouldn't occur if it's titrated slowly, but if it does, we have something to give you to um, help that respiratory depression. Want to move on? Um, now, neuropathic pain meds. As I said, um, that's something that many in the audience um, probably are experiencing. And opiates is usually not the drug of choice for this. What opiates do is it can take the edge off. So when you're starting neuropathic medicines, if you go on opiates for a short period just to take the edge off until the adjuvant analgesics that are used for neuropathic pain build up, that's a good thing. Um, the other thing is it's not unusual to, to require um, one or two of three of these adjuvant um, analgesics. So some are the tricyclic antidepressants and duloxetine, many probably know that as Cymbalta, um, anticonvulsants of all ty types. The most common are um, pregabalin and gabapentin or Neurontin and Lyrica as people know them, but other anticonvulsants or anti-seizure medicines are effective. Clonidine or catapress as it's called is um, very effective and also decreases some of the anxiety and even withdrawal symptoms that you may have. Steroids are very effective but can't be used long term because the side effects are not really good. Local anesthetics, um, intravenously lidocaine, but again you're not going to walk around with it intravenous. So medicines like mixilatine, and this is a traditionally a cardiac medicine. Um, ketamine has been used, baclofen for muscle spasms and neuropathic pain, and there is um, some use of cannabinoids, which um, there have been some reports this actually decreases or stops opiate use. Um, I am not going to go further into this because I know you have a whole lecture on this later in um, the day or tomorrow. You want to move on? Um, so mo emotional spiritual pain occurs almost with everybody having pain. I heard all over nothing helps the pain. I just want to go to sleep and when I wake up all of this will be better. Well, where does some of this suffering come from? Um, there's an unrealistic expectation for a cure when you have a, essentially a long-term chronic illness. Family and caregivers are stressed that they can't help and sometimes they're picking up um, roles in work or doing things at home that um, you used to be able to do. There's a desire to be normal again. There are cultural influences. And there's misunderstanding and denial of some of the um, information that you may receive. Um, you want to move on? Um, hurts all over also presents as anxiety and anticipatory anxiety, um, particularly occurs when there have been previous negative experiences that become overwhelming. And then this leads to difficulty in sleeping and um, having a lot of fatigue um, and lethargy. And that's why fatigue is found so, um, um, so frequently with pain. Again, you can use pharmacology for this. Benzos are generally used much like opiates now very short term. Antidepressants can be used for anxiety. Um, but better than that are some of the mind-body modalities, such as hypnosis, biofeedback, mindfulness, relaxation, imagery, and then even things like massage, music therapy, art therapy, acupressure, acupuncture. Want to move on? Um, as I said, there's caregiver pain also. Um, and so we try to teach that communication is very important between the patient and the caregiver. There are complex family dyma dynamics that um, emerge and the caregiver has a lot of emotions. They can't take away your pain or your symptoms all the time. 
um, which makes them anxious and upset. Um, and what we teach caregivers is really that presence is the very best medicine at times. Um, just being there and, um, you know, holding hands. Want to move on? Justice, this is from Socrates. Just as you ought not to attempt to cure eyes without head or head without body, so you should not treat body without soul. Um, you can move on. Um, so in terms of spirituality, there is a difference between religion and spirituality. Spirituality is the part of self where search for meaning takes place for the patient. It's the connection that people have with family, home, friends, nature, arts, music, work. Um, it can be a connection with religion. It doesn't have to be a connection with religion. It's much larger than religion. Um, and everybody is spiritual and has connections with some of these other things. So they are spiritual, even if you're not religious. Um, do you want to move on? Um, in terms of practical interventions, when we do a spiritual assessment and find their spiritual pain, um, things that can help is reading from a patient's religious group, assisting, finding some spiritual support, things like labyrinths, things like mandalas, and again, ministry of presence or being present. Um, probably the um, most effective intervention. Want to move on? So other non-pharmacologic methods that we use a lot are a lot of the mind-body modalities. And this includes things like biofeedback, hypnosis, imagery, distraction, mindfulness. Um, we then have also labyrinths, which are walking. And you, you can buy finger labyrinths off the internet for $50. Mandelas are pictures that go towards the center and you see them in many things, even like um, indigenous people will make baskets out of mandela and all kinds of art. Um, we use a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy. And why I put expectations here is because expectations has a lot to do with pain and um, pain management. Um, what I've seen culturally is in cultures that, and I have worked outside of um, this country, in cultures that don't have a lot of opiates present, the expectation is that pain is not going to be zero. Um, we expect that there will be some level of pain, and it's important to find ways of distracting or taking you away from that so you continue to function. Um, other things that could be helpful, we do Reiki, which is an energy medicine. Other um, energy medicines that are available include um, healing touch, therapeutic touch. All of these are energy work and patients find them very helpful. Um, we do a lot of pet therapy. I'm a big believer in pet therapy. Um, art therapy, music therapy, and we actually have tea parties. Um, again, it's taking you away from the pain. Want to go to the next slide? So essentially, um, it takes a really big village to practice pain management. Um, and so what you will need are um, um, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, physicians, and then people who do counseling, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, um, acupuncture, acupressure, trigger release, recreation ther therapy that could teach um, stress management, pet music and art therapy, rehabilitation that will teach you things like energy conservation, will give you assistive devices and functional interventions, as well as exercise. Exercise is important in pain management. The other thing that's important is adequate nutrition, um, social work for community resources and socioeconomic support and coping skills, pharmacology to help you um, 
make sure that you're on safe medications and spiritual ministry, which can offer pastoral presence, prayer, hope, peace, labyrinth, and Mandela's. Um, Want to move on? Um, this is Petey. She, Petey was a rescue be beagle of one of our patients that actually had a bone marrow transplant and was with us for about two years. And the patient spoke to Petey on the phone. Petey was in North Carolina and the patient was in Maryland. Um, and I take PD everywhere as the patient requested. So he goes to most lectures. You wanna move on? As I said, pet therapy is very important. So you will be introduced to all my dogs. My husband and I have been married 36 years. The Shih Tzu um, came two weeks after we got married and he died after 15 years. The Bichon um, came when the Shih Tzu was about 13 and he lived for about 14 years. Um, Want to move on? And then these are the last two dogs or as I call them three and four. This Shih Tzu, this Shih Tzu actually just died at the age of 19 years old, June 5th. And we still have left little Bo there. He's an Australian Shepherd Poodle mix. A true lover um, is true pet therapy. Um, I get to do doggy massage continuously when I'm home. Want to move on? So in with complementary therapies, we can do things together like Reiki and hypnosis, but Reiki and acupuncture are both energy work and we found that that doesn't work really well together. Um, sometimes you're doing too much then. Um, we initiate one modality at a time we reevaluate for effectiveness, and usually you need at least a series of six to 12 before you say it doesn't work. Um, so do you wanna move on to the next slide? Um, what are we doing when we use complementary modalities? Well, I think we're touching people in ways that they haven't been touched before, and we're healing even when we can't cure. And most illnesses, um, as well as, I mean, you know, your illness is not, curable, but you can be healed even if you're not cured from an illness. Want to move on? Um, our team, as many who know our team, will do whatever it takes. So this is a man who came to our hospital and was going to have a bone marrow transplant. We asked him what he wanted. He wanted a magic cat and wand. And so we gave him a magic cat and wand when he had his transplant and we all came in with magic cats and wands. So we can do some types of magic. Um, and as you see, humor is a very big thing also for us. Move on. Um, this is one of our, this is our tea part, tea cart that goes out to patients. And we generally will wear hats and boas with our tea carts and everybody gets involved. Wanna move on? Um, and this was um, Mardi Gras day one day, we got dressed up. And um, as you see, we're always um, using a lot of humor. Um, and this patient was in our hospital actually for four years. You want to move on? So um, thank you for listening. And I hope this was helpful. And um, I'll be on the panel virtually by um, telephone and we'll be able to answer any questions you may have.